ನಾಚಿಕೇತಾಖ್ಯಾನಂ ಮೃತ್ಯು ಪ್ರೋಕ್ತ ಸನಾತನ ಉಕ್ತ್ವಾಶ್ರುತ್ವಾಧಾವಿ ಬ್ರಾಹ್ಮಲೋಕೆ ಮಹೀಯತೆ Relating and hearing this eternal anecdote as received by Nachiketa and as told by death the intelligent man becomes glorified in the region that is Brahman Shankaracharya's tika uktva relating to brahmanas cha and shrutva hearing from teachers this sanatanam upakhyanam eternal anecdote eternal because it is vedic that was nachiketam received by nachiketa and mrityuproktam told by death medhavi the intelligent man mahiyate becomes glorified that is he becomes adorable by becoming identified with brahman brahma loke in the region of brahman that is identical with brahman itself ya imam paramam guhyam shravayet brahma sansadi prayata shraddha kale va ತದಾನಂತ್ಯ ಕಲ್ಪತೆ ತದಾಯಂತ್ಯ ಕಲ್ಪತ ಶುಡ್ ಎನಿ ಒನ್ ಆಫ್ಟರ್ ಪ್ಯೂರಿಫಿಕೇಶನ್ ಗೆಟ್ ದಿಸ್ ಹೈಯೆಸ್ಟ್ ಸೀಕ್ರೆಟ್ ರಿಸೈಡೆಡ್ ಬಿಫೋರ್ ಅನ್ ಅಸೆಂಬ್ಲಿ ಆಫ್ ಬ್ರಾಹ್ಮಣಸ್ ಓರ್ ಎಟ್ ದ ಟೈಮ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಸೆರೆಮೋನೀಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ದ ಡೆಡ್ ದೆನ್ ದಟ್ ಸೆರೆಮೋನಿ ಬಿಕಮ್ಸ್ ಕಂಡ್ಯೂಸಿವ್ ಟು ಇಟರ್ನಲ್ ರಿಸಲ್ಟ್ ಇಟ್ ಗಿವ್ಸ್ ಇಟರ್ನಲ್ ರಿಸಲ್ಟ್ indeed and the tika should yaha anyone prayataha after becoming purified idam shravayet cause this text to be recited verbatim as also with explanation that is paramanguhyam the greatest secret brahma sansadi in an assemblage of brahmanas shraddha kale va or at the time of the ceremonies for the dead to the brahmanas seated for the feast then tat that funeral ceremony of that man kalpate becomes conducive anantyaya to eternal result the repetition is for concluding the part Namaste. So these are the final two verses in the first part of the Kata Upanishad. And the next part will get even more nectarian. I don't know if that's possible, but it is. And I want to look back at this chapter 3 because it's a very important chapter. Why? Because it gives the means of attaining the highest brahman in chapter 2 we were given the nachiketa fire but the nachiketa fire is the means for attaining the lesser brahman the secondary brahman devi this one gives the meditations for attaining the higher brahman the unconditioned brahman brahman without qualities near guna brahman and that of course is symbolized by shiva so these meditations that were discussed in the previous verses here are really a natural progression from gross to subtle a uh, meditation that should spontaneously manifest out of deep concentration beginning with the senses the sense objects the senses the mind the intelligence and then finally brahman itself now this is a natural progression and of course we presented this many many times in our chart of the four states of consciousness 
that when a particular type of yoga, karma yoga, for example, which concentrates mainly on the senses and sense objects, when that matures, it automatically becomes bhakti. It automatically elevates you to the next stage, which is svapna consciousness, bhakti yoga. And similarly, when bhakti becomes mature, it automatically elevates you to meditation. So when meditation is complete, then one realizes Brahman. But at first, it is saguna Brahman, Brahman with qualities. So then how do you uh, advance further to the Brahman without qualities? Well, that's the whole point of this chapter. And it gives several different meditation techniques in order to raise your realization to a higher state. Now, that said, that does not mean you can artificially jump up to a higher level than you are authentically realizing. You know, if all you can realize is the senses and sense objects, you have to stick with karma yoga until it matures. Then, when you start to recognize the energy, the prana inside, it can go to a higher level, more subtle level. And certainly, when prana is realized to the extent that it turns into mind stuff and intelligence, that's the next stage meditation. And when meditation matures, one finds oneself in the void, in emptiness. Buddha says, the whole world is empty. Well, what is he talking about? It's empty of real existence. It is only a fabrication, a projection, an overlay, a superimposition, like the rope and the snake. We see a rope but we think it's a snake. And so we project or dream or imagine, overlay or superimpose the image of a snake on this rope. And then we react to it as if it really is a snake. Similarly, sometimes in the desert, there'll be a mirage of water due to refraction of the sun's rays on the hot sand. Sometimes you see this on a road. Looks like water puddles on the road ahead. But when you get there, there's no water. But the foolish animals who can't make any distinction think that it's real. And being thirsty in the desert, they run towards this mirage of water, but there's no water there. So similarly, in this material world, we imagine that there exists all these permanent objects, huh? so-called permanent objects, although science and indeed our own observation would tell us they're all temporary. They're always changing. And more than that, they're illusions, just like the water in the desert. There is no water in the desert. There is no snake in the rope. The snake has nothing to do with the rope. It's simply imagination. Similarly, <laughs> in this world, we think there are so many objects and that they have real existence, but they don't. They are simply projections, imaginations, fabrications of our own mind in name and form, nama rupa. And this nama rupa gives us the illusion that there's a real world out there and that cause and effect are real and so on and so forth. And, you know, maybe they are on the level of these imaginary objects, just like the fear that we feel on seeing the snake, even though it's not real, the fear is real. Just like when we have a dream at night about being chased by a tiger. Huh? What we feel by the fear of seeing this illusion can wake us up in the middle of the night, sweating. <laughs> oh, wait a minute, there's no tiger. <laughs> it was just a dream. And the same thing happens when we realize Brahman. 
when we realize I am Brahman, aham brahmasmi, at that time, all the unreality goes away, or rather it is seen for what it really is, which is just a fabrication, just a dream. It's just like any dream. And it will also go away when we realize the Nirguna Brahman. We talked about that in the last video, uh, quoting that wonderful verse from Brihadaranaka Upanishad. So what happens to the person who actually hears and understands this Upanishad is that he goes to the world of Brahman. And because of his attaining similar quality to Brahman, then he is revered, he is adored, he is worshipped, he is welcomed, he is loved in this world of Brahman. Because Brahman is reality. Brahman never changes. Brahman is eternal, indestructible. Uh, no birth, no death. That's the nature of Brahman. So when we go to this world of Brahman, then there's no more suffering. There's no more birth or death, no more scarcity, no more fear of any kind. Everything is wonderful, everything is beautiful. This is the paradise that many religions talk about, but they can't deliver. Only these Upanishads actually deliver. Not even the Vedas, not even the Vedic rituals can deliver this level of self-realization only by contemplation and realization of Brahman. So the final verse is very wonderful because it says, if anyone, after being purified by all this meditation and this contemplation of the truths of Brahman, should get this Upanishad recited, usually by a qualified Brahmana, a reciter of Vedas, of Sanskrit, in front of an audience of Brahmans, then this is the greatest thing that you can do. This is, of all rituals, this is the greatest ritual. So at any festival or any religious place of pilgrimage where people gather to worship God, if one gathers some brahmanas, some uh, qualified devotees, and especially at a ceremony for the dead, the Shraddha ceremony, this is a very common thing in India, and has this recited nicely with understanding and explanations especially, then the result of that ceremony is eternal. In other words, it's not simply karma, like the ordinary rites and rituals of the Vedas. It's not an ordinary sacrifice. It does not result in promotion to the heavenly planets, but rather it brings one to the world of Brahman. And this is where we want to go, because this is the world where there's no more birth and death. Even if we go to the heavenly planets, the ordinary heavenly planets, the homes of the demigods. We have to come back again. But when we go to the world of the immortals, we never come back. Uh, that place, once you go there, you never come back to this material world. That's the whole point of the Upanishads. And they are different from the Vedic rituals because the Vedic rituals only give you good karma. And that good karma, just like all karma, is temporary. And as soon as it's used up, you come back again to this world. But the gateway to immortality is death. That's why death is the speaker of Katopanishad. And we'll see in the next part how that is so. But just for now, take it for me that death is the one who determines whether someone is eligible for liberation. For example, in the case of Nachiketa, he examined Nachiketa. He tempted him by offering all kinds of material benedictions. Then Nachiketa was like, no thanks, you know. <laughs> Let all that stay with you. 
I don't require that because it won't give me immortality. It won't give me realization of Brahman. In fact, it will deviate me. It will distract me. It will debilitate me by using the senses in acts of enjoyment instead of acts of piety and meditation. So I don't want all these things. I don't want this enjoyment. I don't want this uh, wealth or power. I don't want any of that stuff. I want to know your secret, Death. <laughs> what is the secret of whether a man uh, exists or doesn't exist after death? And this secret is, if someone is a Pashu, in other words, if they are an animalistic human being, and that includes the followers of the Vedas, because they're servants of the gods, they are separated from the subtle bodies. And that's why they lose their identity and lose the memory of their previous lives. And then they have to take another birth according to the causes they created by their karma. But those who, like Nachiketa, become qualified, they are freed by death they can go to the higher realms. And there, they get actually all the objects of desire without any impediments, without any negatives. Uh, in this world, even the best things are imperfect. But in that world, everything is perfect. <laughs> so that's where we want to go. And the way we get there is by qualifying for death to release us from the rebirth. Now, final moksha, complete release, is only given by Shiva. But any of the immortals can grant entrance into the higher heaven. And this is what is happening. This is the, the big story, huh? the big picture of this Upanishad, that Nachiketa is going to death. Death finds him qualified. So he instructs him in the knowledge of Brahman, that knowledge knowing which there is nothing further to be known. Aung Tatsa, Aung Shakti Aung, Aung Namah Shivaya. <laughs>